thank you, everyone. Yeah. You know, thanks for coming. Do you know what this is all about? Please ask questions. Yeah. Yeah, I think everybody knows the team, right? Jeffrey, you know, everybody knows David, yeah. Bruce, yeah. Joy, Kenneth, and me. So, I, so, who wants to go first? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Do that or I don't know. Do I need to use the microphone to, to record? Yeah, that would be okay. No, I will. No, it's okay. I can do it. Yeah. Um, I apologize if this was already in a session that I didn't. But what's the difference in functionality with uh, PowerShell Core and PowerShell Now? Like, how far are you uh, reaching the gap? How? What's the status of it? This one fall on me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I have a slide on this, and my slide deck will be up uh, eventually. But um, essentially, uh, the, the biggest differences are between the CLRs. So .NET Core and .NET Full have uh, a different API set. That gap's being closed over time. .NET Core 2.0 uh, uh, implements uh, something called .NET Standard 2.0, which is a, a very large, uh, you know, over... over uh, intersection between between uh, full CLR and core CLR, um, and then within PowerShell, the the language uh, is essentially the same uh, from a language standpoint. Uh, there's a number of commandlets that are still missing, and that's because of the lack of functionality in the full CLR. Um, we have a known issues document in the PowerShell repo on GitHub um, that tracks a lot of the commandlets that we know about today. It's it's an incomplete document. I'll say today we need to update it, um, but uh, but the commandlet dif difference is there. Um, and then from a PowerShell feature perspective, uh, we, we don't plan to bring back uh, workflows, um, uh, WMI v1 support, so like the get to be my method. Um, and uh, uh, there's there's one more that I'm blanking on. Uh, Snap-ins. Snap yeah. yeah. Death to snap-ins. Yeah. No snap-in yeah. support. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. By the way, just in, in, I could get this wrong. You actually know better, Joey. But I, my recollection is like .NET Standard 2.0 is like almost twice as comprehensive as the yeah, as so core. They're, yeah, they're they're calling it 99% .NET 4.5.1 with an asterisk. So uh, it's it's an extreme. Yeah, it's it's I think more than double what was in .NET Core 1.1. Yeah. Um, we deleted like 4,500 lines of code already from the PowerShell code base just because we don't have to do something different for different CLRs now. We are gonna. I mean, you can. You know, the thing that we're gonna do for the existing uh, Windows commandlets with their shipping in bus. One of the things that we are driving is for the the Windows components team to basically retest their commandlets in the standard 2.0 when it becomes available. Now, I think that will happen within the next year. We'll get all the commandlets validation, yeah. but I think that's why I think our level of confidence is gonna be really high. If whatever issues we find, we'll go back to the .NET team and be sure that they fix those issues. So and then by the time we go into sort of what I would call full .NET 2 standard PowerShell, the coverage ho will, will help it will be 99% should work. Uh, yeah, so it's worth pointing out, uh, as with every one of our, our releases, we often fix a bug that when we look at it, we say, hmm, this might break a, a, a script. Um, but often we evaluate that against, hey, those are probably, you know, when it's very edge cases, we just say, hey, it's fine to introduce a breaking change. It was a bug, uh, might break a script, et cetera. And you know, has anybody encountered that? Yeah, very few, right? But we've had a number of them. As we now support Linux, a number of issues like that come up. In order to do a proper job of supporting Linux, we need to make some changes uh, that will introduce some breaking changes. But we're, by and large, most of them, I think, have been on the edge cases. So it's just something to be aware of. So if you come back and say, hey, um, you know, indeed, if you encounter something like that, please report it to us. And then we'll just declare, oh, OK, that was an unintentional thing. Or we'll be explicit with you about, no, that's, a, that's an intentional fix. But mostly, we don't expect that you'll encounter that. Is that correct, Bruce? Is there anything? Oh. Now, the, the one exception to that will be the aliases. So, you know, we grab the LS alias and the curl alias, et cetera. It's clearly the wrong thing to do Oops. to make those available, uh, to take those uh, uh, names over in the Unix space. So we will not do that. And then that leaves us with the question of, well, then what do we do in the Unix, in the Windows space? Do we still grab them, et cetera? So we're, th that's just a hard problem. 
and there's no good answer. And so we're having lots of discussions about what the least bad answer is. So. And, and feedback, feedback will drive that. Yeah. And we have our own personal experiences and <laughs> our own personal ice cream cones. Um, we have our own individual experiences because we all have our, our profiles and so forth. But it's really the community that can give us much more, more input on what the default should be. So you know, I load up my profiles about a thousand lines long. I have a very customized environment, obviously. Um, but what the out of box experience should be is something that the community can really help us with. But clearly, if you've written scripts with LS in them and you want them to work on on Linux, you're going to have to change them. Yeah. I can tell you that. Yeah. I, I just uh, I, this guy here had his hand up right at the beginning. I just want to make sure. This is rather a technical question. Uh, oh. We know that AppLocker switches to constraint language mode if it detects, no, that PowerShell switches to constraint language if it detects AppLocker. Some may also know already how this detection is done, and I wondered how this detection mechanism was developed. Matt, do you know the answer to that? There's Matt, I saw him come in. You're going to touch the bus yeah, so uh, I'm not on the PowerShell team, just to make that clear. And He just, he just reverse engineers I, I, everything and knows more about it than yeah. we do. I, I've only been at Microsoft for two months, but so I, I can't speak to the genesis of constrained language mode and uh, why it was built in the first place. I mean, I, I can speculate the reason would be for um, just for more lockdown, like constrained endpointing scenarios. How do they detect the device guards being used? Do we detect? Oh, so. <laughs> Actually, uh, this came up recently at work. Uh, there was a coworker of mine who was wondering uh, whether or not um, an attack was uh, was uh, was was going through, and uh, because he noticed that um, there were. It was like one to three, like randomly named PS1 and like PSM1 files were being created um, every time PowerShell was started up. And actually, that is the check that's being done. So these random files are created, they write the string one into them, and then they use those to validate app locker policies against those. So when you see those randomly named files created at, 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 uh, at runtime, that's the reason. It's just kind of like a hacky thing that they they had to do. This is just a, a very brief. This is a very brief conversation I had with Lee Holmes about this, who would have the definitive answer on go. this. Yeah, you know, I was almost tempted to to answer your question. Uh, there's a great story about when I first came to Microsoft. I worked on a management portal, and so we were going to demo it to Bill Gates. And so I thought, you know what? They, there was this young engineer worked his ass off on this thing. I said, you come along and you demo it to Bill. And so he's there, and he's demoing to Bill Gates, richest guy in the world, right? Smartest guy in the world. And so he's demoing, and we showed Bill drag and drop for the first time. So I didn't do that, drag and drop. And first time Bill had ever seen this. He says, wait, do that again. So drag and drop. <laughs> and I said, how did you do that? I said, well, actually, we have the developer here. This is Filippo. Filippo explained to Bill how he did it. And the kid was just so petrified. He said, code. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, well, Bill, apparently we use code to achieve that function. I'll get back to you with the details. So the answer to your question is, we used code. <laughs> Next question. Who's got the mic? Who's got the next question? We'll do that. We'll have the next question. Somebody pass the mic. Okay. Go for it. Can you talk about uh, how decisions are made uh, regarding the future direction of PowerShell? How does your process look like? I bet you would, there's six different answers to that question. Well, there is no, so, so it's an interesting thing. I, it, it comes from so many different sources. It's really difficult you know, just to point out that there is a process about how we come up with ideas. 
I mean, we are here in this event, if we come in with ideas, right? I think it comes from multiple sources. One is what customers are telling us, what are we, our observations on what's going on in the industry, and then uh, internally in the company, we look at strategically what other uh, products, the other uh, business are going. So and then you start collecting all this data, and then you start basically framing, you know, a direction, and then you validate that direction either internally or with customers or partners. I'm sure some of you've been involved in those type of exercises. And once you collect all that information, and then you start basically brainstorming about, hey, look, what do we think it would look like? If we went and follow this direction, what if we do DevOps? What does that would look like for us? What if we want to go and move into hybrid management? What does that would look like? What will happen if you take something like PowerShell and you bring it in Linux? So and then you start basically brainstorming with people. If you start collecting these, it does start sort of framing, you know, what we're going to do. Okay, frame it a different way. So I, I'd yeah. say that first off, it's a bit of a, a bit of an, a jazz thing, right? Sort of ad hoc. But in reality, there are three streams of inputs into our decision making process. And this is best mirrored. We were very formal about this when we did our Windows Server planning. But effectively, this uh, we do the same model in, in PowerShell. And that is, first is there's the voice of the marketplace, right? So there are some Uber trends that, you know, if I go talk to individual customers, they're not going to spot those trends, right? And so we look at the marketplace, where the competitors are going, where the investment capital is going, what are the big industrial uh, industry trends? So that's one thing we get in focus. The second and most important is customers. Like, what are customers telling us? What are they telling us their problems are? What are they telling us their opportunities are, et cetera? And then the third is the technology. What is the technology, et cetera? And then honestly, from there, we have you know kind of three discrete signals, and then we discuss, and we prioritize, and we fight. Like, hey, you know what, guess what? Uh, as I mentioned, going to .NET Core, boy, that was a big pain in the butt. Team didn't want to do that, right? They're like, hey, I, I can do all these features using, you know, added to full, you know, Windows PowerShell. Uh, I won't be able to do those to go to core PowerShell. But you looked at the technology and its ability to bring us into Linux and the fact that as a company, we need to be supporting Linux as much as Windows. And so then we had to say, yep, that's great, but we're going to make this big bet. So yeah. I think it's. And I think that's the strategic initiative. By the way, no, oh, that's right. No, I think that's the. I, I think I think you know he's right, but it, but but there is a notion of a strategic initiative which happens in Microsoft. It's like we're going to plumb into Azure. Okay, we're going to go into Windows. There's a there's a series of things which are kind of in flight, and you hook yourself to that train. Also, there's some practicalities involved. I think the way you hear, we are consistent. I think there's this theme, right? That I think even happens closer in your company as well. I mean, you really got to think about you know the customer, the technology. You know, where the industry is going, you collect this information and then you brainstorm. If from there you go into planning, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to planning, that's when reality comes into question, right? That's when you start realizing what you can and cannot do because, hey, there's so many resources you have, there's so much time that you have, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are the constraints that they get imposed, right? That's where planning help you to take from this sort of future investment into reality. You know, sometimes it's difficult because, you know, we want to all do big things. And sometimes you realize the big things takes a lot of the time and resources, so you got to prioritize. All right, I think Peter had the next one. Yes. Uh, Actually, before you go down there, I want to interrupt just one more thing, because this, this came up a few times in the past days, and that's one of the key inputs more and more are issues on GitHub. Yes, please. So I had a few people come up and say, well, how do they... Describe their problem, it was very interesting. I love that, keep doing that. But then the question was, okay, how do I take action on it? I said, file an issue on GitHub. <laughs> it really is. PowerShell 6.0, file that issue. Phosphorus, file that issue. And they were thinking, and in some cases, there were more strategic issues. They were saying, well, it's not really a bug. It's just, I wonder if you should go here directionally. That's why it's right? not called bug. How about this issue, you know? And so don't be bashful. If we don't like it, we won't act on it. But if there's data, then the more people who provide that data, the more insight it finally gives us. So absolutely, one of the great ways for each of you to impact where we go is to file the issue, be it a small bug or a strategic thought in the GitHub repos. I didn't want to leave that without that observation, how you impact our planning. Okay, thank you. Oh, now in the community as well. 
Well, you guys don't want to listen to Peter, do you? Well, you must be dreading this question. Stop. Huh. No, no, it's all right. Any questions over there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know why. I have, I have two questions. Uh, when do we get a German PowerShell help? That's, that's good. <laughs> I think it, I, 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 I think we're going to do a Spanish first. Okay. <laughs> no. No, I, I will, I will say Germans, that we've, we've had a, a conversation about this uh, uh, before. I don't know if any of you have noticed these uh, open localization repos in our PowerShell organization, um, but they're actually a, a lot of the non commandlet help has been has been localized at this point. I, I don't know if it was to German. I believe we did like a bunch of the DSC help on MSDN and this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to figure out a way of how to uh, uh, integrate Platypus, which is the mammal generator that we use uh, with some of the localization stuff that's going on. But yeah, it's it's uh, I, no promises or ETAs, but like we're we're trying to work through this right now. Okay. The next question is: Will the next version of PowerShell be a true mobile version that can be run from a USB stick, for example, or doesn't it have any dependency to the registry anymore? Uh, so, so like a fully portable, like yes. like droppable. So, so today, uh, one of the one of the releases that we put out of PowerShell six is a zip, and you can unpack that zip and drop it anywhere you like and and run that thing, and it it uh, it doesn't. I want to say that it doesn't use the registry because we had to be fully side by side and and work for Mac and Linux, and so PowerShell Core six I, I think should be fully portable. Um, we also are, are trying to get Raspberry Pi support and, and uh, ARM64 support and that sort of thing so that you can run on thinner and thinner devices. So, it yeah. yeah, it runs, runs on Windows 10 IoT yeah. today, and, and we want that generalized to any IoT device, uh, whether it's Windows 10 or not. So we think it is. If it isn't, let us know. Yeah, and there is an RFC out there right now on... Uh, configuring PowerShell, basically how we would be, it would be a replacement for all the stuff that's in the registry. So you might want to take a look at that PowerShell PowerShell dash RFC uh, on our GitHub site and uh, make any comments if you're if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, short one. I love all the new PowerShell heroes. What's this one called? That's the PowerShell avatar. We don't have a name called PowerShell. You, you can open an RSC and, and we can start voting. <laughs> you give us some ideas. I like that. Is it going to be Spanish or German? No, something that I can pronounce. That narrows the list. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, I was I was wondering, is it one time uh, we can find the PowerShell help in the MSDN as well? As we have C sharp, C plus plus, F sharp, or whatever. Oh, but still PowerShell, no PowerShell examples. Stuff. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so you're talking about so the, you're talking about PowerShell examples for .NET API help, um, and yeah, I I we've talked about this. There was a major connect item a long time ago. Uh, we talked about this with the MSDN team. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you have noticed a lot of the the. MSDN documentation is transitioning to docs.microsoft.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, docs.microsoft.com, really cool platform. Um, I, I think we need to make this happen in the doc effects engine, which is uh, publicly available. It's what .NET uses to generate the help. And uh, I don't know of any active development going on there right now for PowerShell, but this is potentially a feature that I think could be contributed to the community if it was a high enough priority. Well, Bruce, do you think yeah. that uh, we have the, enough, uh, the language support is rich enough to, to do that for all the examples? Probably is. Oh, okay. At some point, we didn't, you know, we didn't support generics, etc. And when we looked at this, it's like, yeah, this isn't going to work. We still don't support generic methods. But... Oh, okay. So, yeah. there you go. Yeah. You know, one thing that I want to highlight about MSDN and TechNet. I don't know if you noticed, we are starting moving more content into the dark, uh, the new dark side. So I think one of the things that we are doing right now is we speak, and actually we have even a score. Scott Garthy is actually helping us as we are cleaning all the documentation and examples. If we are bringing all new content into the dark side, it's start basically keeping MSDN and TechNet as more of a repository for existing content, but not for new content in the future. Next Q. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Here. I'll be the runner. Yeah. Like Phil Donahue. Right. <laughs> 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 
miss that. Thank you. Just running for me. Um, <laughs> what happened to the script team guys? And more on a private note, how is X doing? It has become very quiet mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah, uh, go ahead. What is Okay, I just didn't understand. So Ed uh, retired this year. You know, uh, he decided it was time for him to travel and to write a book. And so that's really what he was doing. He we just recently saw him in the PowerShell Summit uh, in North America. Uh, he's doing quite well. His head is a lot longer. Uh, he looks like he's retired. Uh, <laughs> so, but one of the things that the, he and I we've been discussing is about what happens with the scripting guy. We know it's been a great place where you go, many people on the planet is going to actually find content and help and how to get in started with PowerShell or for topics that, that you care. So one of the things that we are doing within the organization is really start shifting the scripting guide to be more scripting guys. Where we're gonna start is open it to the community. This is one of the sort of uh, suggestions that Ed give to the team. It's like, let's expand this. We are in a point right now that we have a very large community. We have a lot of knowledge and experience that is beyond just one individual or two. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna expand it to the community. We're gonna have people within our teams that will start uh, posting blogs, but we wanna open the blogging as well for you. If what we're gonna do, we're gonna put some capabilities to actually curate the content. We'll have some editor, sort of resources that will work with you. It help you to take contents that you want to submit. We'll clean that, we'll curate them, and then we'll publish them in, in the scripting guys. Okay, thank Sounds you. Good. Look forward yeah, good to question. it. Good question, thank you. Next question. Are we here? Oh, oh, oh. Go. <laughs> yeah, go. Two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, what's the direction of MDM, DSC, and group policy for the next years? Is there, there any... Uh, Pass that die or something else, and the second one: How large are the groups that develop such uh, PowerShell or Windows or something else? <coughs> so the, the developer who writes the code. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so first question is about group policy. So group policy is in Windows. Uh, uh, I don't think it's going to go any anyway anywhere soon, for sure. It's going to be around for a long time. But I think the question is, what is the role of DSC and, and configuration policy management in the future? Yeah, I think it definitely, I mean, we've seen DSC and the evolution of DSC is the, is the vehicle for you to actually manage configuration policy. Um, for example, for nano server, one of the things that we got to do is to actually bring DSC. So DSC becomes that sort of configuration policy in nano. And through services like Azure Automation and Configuration Services, we're going to start enable the ESC. It's sort of, I won't call it a, a true uh, replacement to group policy because group policy does a lot more than just configuration. But when it comes to configuration and policy of those configurations, I see DSC and Azure Configuration Services as the vehicle to actually provide that sort of functionality that group policy gives you today. About the size of teams, I don't know, so, by the way, anybody wants to add anything else about group policy or act? I know I'll, I'll be more forthright. <laughs> Look, the reality is, is that uh, in, in Windows, we just don't have a, an architecture for configuration, right? It's crap, full stop. In Linux, it's very clear, right? I got a configuration file, I modify the file, happy days. On Windows, people are putting it in the registry, they're putting it here, they're putting it in any files. There's no architecture, right? And so, fine, people are trying to deal with the fact that there isn't a coherent architecture. And so then there's a couple different efforts to do it, right? Group policy was one. Oh, hey, everything was being in the reg. Oh, but it's not in the registry. So then you have these group policy client-side handlers, which do God knows what. I have no idea. Uh, you know, maybe Matt Graber could reverse engineer it and tell us. That, that might be valuable. No one knows. And then SMS is very client-oriented. MDM is another, you know, solution. Uh, we tried to, in the server space, we tried to say we are going to provide a, an architecture across the sea of incoherence. That architecture is called desired state configuration. It is a well-defined way to give us a configuration document in an idempotent way, and we are driving that architecture across scenarios, right? And we're largely focused in on the server. 
and not so much on the client. If the client wants to do that, that's happy days, but we're largely focused in on service scenarios, both Windows and Linux. Now, the client, honestly, has got a challenge, right? I believe that there are two coherent views of the future. Uh, one is a server view of the world, right? Where a server view of the world, you want fine-grained control over everything because you really can get you know, huge value out of differences in configuration. And then I believe that there's, there's the world of true devices, right? Where the, you want to configure them and you want to configure them all the same way and you don't have a lot of devices. You know, sorry, you don't have a lot of settings. That's sort of what MDM's trying to do. They're trying to say, hey, phones and um, desktops can be treated as a device. We'll see how successful that'll be. But that's, I think, the, the more you know, forthright answer. In terms of size, God knows. Yeah. <laughs> Windows has a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> last exactly. time. I know that, but we don't know the exact numbers. More uh, than two, less than 2,000. Yeah. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, my question is, um, there was a PowerShell module for Windows containers, mm. and then it was replaced um, with the Info just use Docker directly. And my question is why? Because many features in Windows have um, PowerShell modules. Yeah. So, um, so there was the Hyper-V team shipped a, a containers module that used a proprietary API uh, that sat in between, uh, it would basically shim between uh, the, the the API, and then it would go to Docker or Hyper-V, depending on uh, what you were trying to manage. Um, and they decided that Docker had really become the definitive way to manage containers across the container ecosystem. And so they decided to get rid of that and just use the Docker API uh, to manage containers. Um, so that module uh, got removed because it used the old API, but there's also uh, a Docker PowerShell so module the, that they the developed. The API got removed. The API got removed. The API yeah. got removed, and therefore the commandlets got removed. Right. Yeah. And so there's a, uh, and, and I think that was all in technical previews. So yeah. it's, you know, no one should have taken any, you know, production dependencies on, on that module. Um, but there is now a, a, a PowerShell module on GitHub called Docker PowerShell that actually works on Linux as well. Um, and this is sort of the, the brilliance of why they, they moved to the Docker API is that they're able to do everything in a platform agnostic way now. Um, and, and I don't know what the status of that module is right now, whether it's going to make its way into Windows. I, I imagine it will at some point. Yeah, I haven't um, but that that's, one. But that one, I, we did a fantastic demo of that at LinuxCon last year. I mean, the Linux guys, their heads were exploding, right? We had a Linux box, we had a Windows box. We go and we say, hey, here's a, a set of PowerShell commands uh, running on Windows to manage Windows containers. Happy days. Then we go on the Linux box. Exact now, PowerShell running on Linux, we run exactly the same commands to manage containers on the Linux box. Then we go back to Windows and say, but Docker is a REST API. So I change an environmental variable. I run effectively the same commands, a little slightly different, but effectively the same commands. And now I'm on Windows managing the containers on Linux. And then the same thing. Now I'm on Linux, I change configuration, and I'm running the script, and I'm managing the containers on Windows. This was just the perfect example of that. Any client managing any server anywhere it is just gorgeous. And there's, I think there's an awesome video on Channel 9 of, of you with Patrick Lang from the Hyper-V team doing that demo. Oh, did we? Good. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was from our August launch. If you look around the August 2016 timeframe, that's right in there. I highly recommend it. One of my best. <laughs> Next question. Um, well, it's half a serious and uh, half a serious, uh, ha non serious and a serious question. Um, when I'm explaining PowerShell to my customer, and I asked them about the version. They say, well, I have 1.0. And I said, um, no, um, I just explain about the variable. And they said, no, it's the file path with 1.0. And that's just, just a question. Is there any change planned for the future? That no. is, well, it, it, but it's no. not. Well, <laughs> oh, not the background because story? The so, okay, so you might have heard the story that. Um, that it was a bit of a struggle to get PowerShell out. 
and there were what two or almost maybe three years it was just pure oh, hell yeah. They were just coming after us. They were trying to find one reason or another to kill us. But we were like, it is a little hard when your boss wants to kill your project. True. And we actually True. had to go to the boss's boss to get permission to continue the project. And then he was still trying to sabotage all the time. It was a fascinating experience. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. And by the way, that guy wrote our reviews, just to be clear. <laughs> so, so the net of that is PowerShell cost us personally a lot of money. That's, which is true. Anyway, but we were like cockroaches, man. They couldn't kill us, man. We, we would shuttle. We would, we would hide underneath the cabinets. I mean, we would just... Anyway. <laughs> Every few months, we'd have to come up with a new reason for why we had to exist. It was That's awesome. Right. And then they, they, they'd formalize this challenge. Oh, you must do this. By the way, that's one of those is how we ended up with snap-ins, okay. which I don't think anyone liked. No. But it shut up this one guy, and if he didn't shut up, we couldn't ship. So that's why we have snap-ins, and that's why when we got out from underneath that guy, we tried to get rid of snap-ins as quickly as possible. So that's that. <clears throat> versioning was the same thing. You can't ship unless you have versioning. And so I had to go through and, and go through this deep, comprehensive analysis of versioning. I don't know if you know the story. Versioning's not a problem. Versioning's not a problem. Truly, it's not a problem. Problems can be solved. Versioning can't be solved. It's a dilemma. <laughs> no. so, so things that can't be solved are merely dilemmas which be, must be managed. And so we articulated all the pieces of the, the components of versioning, and one of the components was the language. And so basically, if we ever decided that, hey, like say we decided to go to Linux, we wanted to re you take this opportunity and redo the language and introduce a bunch of breaking changes. That would be something that we would change PS1 to PS2. But as long as we can preserve integrity of the language, we'll stay at PS1. It's not only the file extension, it's the whole file path. Yeah. You have to, no, 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 no. no, no, no. But actually, it would, and I'll say that the serious answer to the question for six is that when we install now, we drop it in a correct uh, version number. Oh, okay. So program files, PowerShell, v6.0.0. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Next Thanks. question. We're going to the future. Sorry. Sorry. I think you've got wrenches, huh? Does it? It's a That are wrenches that they're getting thrown at us. I tend to tell my uh, customers that PowerShell is the number one. So this is PS1. I love it. That's right. I'm in. So, uh, we than face, being a we, yeah. we face the number two. We face an enormous growth of uh, commandlets. Uh, we have thousands of commandlets from all over the places. Uh, back then, you invented uh, the idea of have a two-letter prefix at the noun, something like get ad user. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I missed something, but somehow that got lost. Mm -hmm. But it would be required. What about naming conventions? There are lots of issues. Is that a topic? Yeah, I recently, for example, I recently saw a, a module from a, from a Microsoft colleague. Uh, he's got a command get file. That that's an issue, right? Yeah. So we've solved lots of technical problems, but we haven't solved stupidity. Uh, <laughs> that was you said. And and, and we, uh, you know, so the prefix of the guidance there was to avoid. Uh, uh, um, Collisions. Collisions, namespace right. collisions, and it was actually three to four suggestions. And then, indeed, we have some people who don't use them. That's bad. And then we have people who have things like Azure RM. Like yeah. That's a little bit more than four. And, yeah. Yeah. and by the way, so then for Azure Stack, I had my guys doing Azure RM Stack. It's like, no, no, not on my watch. <laughs> I'm not going to be that guy. So you'll see the new versions of them are AZS. There's really an issue here, actually, for even if you just look back, I mean, there's different views on this that say, hey, you should be really, really, really strict, right, or not at all strict, and, and we've, we've been on both sides of that fence, particularly as we hit the modules, okay, you know, and now we emit warnings sometimes if you're using, for example, not one of the, one of the approved verbs, you know, and in the early days, we didn't even do that, right, we thought about it, and then the community said, oh, we, in fact, we want you to lock it down, but then we looked at, oh, there's a lot of new verbs that actually make some sense that we haven't. So, no, we, all remember this... it was Citrix, Citrix decided Citrix was a verb. Yeah, well. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, we got to Well, fix Citrix, this. but even, but even when you got outside of our normal domain and deploy other things. And so, the, the issue really comes down to us is like, how much do we empower the community to go forth and do with guidance, and how much do we enforce? And I'm not sure we've always got it right. But that's the that's the challenge. The the, the conventions. In fact, there's a I, 
we still look at the same basic, here's how you should write a commandlet convention. Did you ever go look at that stuff? It's still good. It's right. Um, but not everybody follows it. And we haven't forced them to yet. So. I wonder, uh, you know, I wonder if we should do something in the PowerShell gallery. You know, as we, start bringing, right, as we start bringing new sort of curated command lines and modules, then maybe that is the place that we can sort of do some level of enforcement. You'll be able to say, look, if you don't follow this particular naming, and then, you know, you are not basically what we consider a high quality command line, so all modules, and we're going to just bring you back into GitHub. So maybe, I don't know what you think, but I think yeah. that's maybe something that we can start. I get doing. that that would put some pressure in, some soft pressure. That yeah. would be a good, good yeah. idea if you don't yeah. want to enforce it. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's how we uh, do that, that's planning. A, a, a quick follow-up <laughs> question. Uh, yeah. We had that before with Joey. Uh, what do you think of the idea to have such uh, super performing um, commands as Docker, Azure CLI, as a replacement for a huge amount of commandlets? Is that a vision for PowerShell to reduce the PowerShell? This goes to all of us, uh, all of you, to reduce the PowerShell uh, for the core shell mm -hmm. and get a little bit away from the commandlets? You, you know what yeah. I'm thinking about? To get rid of all the uh, unnecessary commandlets as in Docker. Yeah. I haven't... I don't know how to... Uh, I can't remember the No. <laughs> <laughs> that, good answer. Um, to be clear, here's what happens, right? I mean, you have the same... Here's what happens if you allow it or you encourage it. You just end up with all these sub subsystems that have no rules mm -hmm. and that are avoiding the framework that PowerShell provides in terms of error handling and everything else because they're in their own universe, right? And so we'd much rather have you use namespaces or letters and so forth and still maintain you know, a, a complete visibility of all your commands. And if you're confused, if you need you pack things together, so you can use you know, modules or you use uh, you know, higher level commands and encapsulate other commands and you, grow, and you grow the abstraction in that way, right? So you can always abstract things to end levels on purpose with modules, we did that, you know, was it V2, but you can still continue to do yeah. it. And, and, but that's the way to do it, it's with abstractions. It's not with trying to create a whole new subsystem underneath because they're, it's random, which sort of goes against what exactly. we'd like to do. Exactly, it provides a random experience, random, they all do their own parsers, thousands of crappy little parsers, different error messages for the same context, different blah, 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 blah. It's complete incoherence, right? Now, we have thought about the opposite, which is to say, hey, would it make sense to be able to take a module and produce it as an XE? So Azure, as, uh, you know, Azure Stack, create the AZ, AZ, AZS command, AZS.exe thing, which just provided their commands. We talk about that, that's a good idea, but it just hasn't popped in the priorities. We, we talk about the, in the concept of microservices. And they say, can you yeah. actually, right? Because we've been talking about, so you're thinking about microservices, kind of makes all of the sense just to follow uh, Jeffrey's thought that you can actually have a module that you can compile quotes, so you can put it in a, in a container, you can actually run as a microservice. Right, okay. So those are the, the, I will encourage, uh, especially as people have ideas about this, yeah. it's definitely something that we want to explore. We will almost certainly do that at yeah. some point. Yep. Many programming languages have some sort of like using this type, and you give a short name and, and then specify what full name it goes to. So, so uh, having the same thing for if you have a, a collision with two names of commandlets in different modules, being able to say get module A foo and you yeah. get module B foo as... Yeah, so you, you can do that. You can use module qualified names. Yes. Okay. You can use module qualified names to distinguish modules with the same one. You can also import, when you import a module, you can change its name, import prefix. And so you can add a new prefix to distinguish the modules. So you can use the base name uh, but still distinguish which module or which commands you're using from which modules. So we do actually do support that. Almost. You can't do it on a per command basis. You can do it per name, per, mo per module, right? So, right. Yeah. No, no, no. You can, the, say, you can say, when you say import module, you can say minus command. Right? No yeah, you, you could command. import one command at a time. Um, but if you, if, <laughs> yeah. Is this a PowerShell script? Yeah, module, you know, exclude, you know, yeah. But that's also something that in the using stuff. I think, I think if you look in the code for using, uh, Jason has sort of, uh, using sort of, the using type, yeah. But using using command 
using uh, using module uh, as or something like that. We can the the pieces are there; they're just not fully implemented uh, on the using side. On the import module dash prefix, that's that is definitely there. Yeah, the one. Um, I'm sorry. The one who uh, implemented the Hyper-V module must have known that, or VMware um, uh, <laughs> beat you to it. Because if you have the VMware module loaded and the Hyper-V module, and you run your script, very strange things happen because both of them have get VM, for example. Mm. So it's the the loading prefix is is a <coughs> is a must in that case. I have yeah, the scripts. If I run it on my laptop, which is Hyper-V enabled. The whole yeah, this, hell is, breaks loose. <clears throat> this is why we created that. You know, the answer is we try and set these guidelines, and and if people follow the guidelines, everything's going to be happy to some really quite large sigma, right? But then, but then, you know, you're giving it to humanity, right? Humanity's going to do what humanity's going to do, and they're going to screw up. And so then we have mechanisms for dealing with that screw up. Now it's not always the cleanest, etc. But you do. I draw a distinction. You can do something or you can't do something. And if you can do something, is it easy or is it hard, right? And so we provide mechanisms so that you can always do something about it. Um, that's what that's And about. over time, we've had thoughts and we've just not been able to implement them because we've got so much else to do of what we called like commandlet families, which said, hey, maybe you could just say git VM and then we could dynamically determine actually where you wanted to go, and there's various ways of actually getting that articulated. But In fact, that is that is the scenario. We we declare the right to grab a noun, an unadorned noun, and we will do that like job when we provide a framework that we want other people to plug in. That's right. So that's when you see us not follow that convention. That's what's going on there. Modules that have the same name, the same command, it's a different model. And it's always something that we could warn. It's like, warn them that, that they are, their command is unambiguous. Un unambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. So, yeah, implicit loading is wonderful until it's not. And. <laughs> And, and it can be not a lot. So if you want to have a predictable environment, using disabling uh, implicit loading is really what you have to do, and explicitly load the module and version you want. Um, Wait, how do you disable implicit there's loading? A, there's a variable that you can set, the name of which escapes me. I insisted. <laughs> I made Lee. I, I made Lee put it in. I didn't know that. So you can disable. You can. Dis it was. It was for workflow because we wanted to have oh, yeah, yeah, reliable sure. loading of commands for workflow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you'll notice in DSC, when you compile DSC, it actually embeds the name, not just the name of the, the resource, but the module and the version number. So it isn't loading ad hoc uh, stuff from whatever's lying around. It loads a very specific version of a specific module. Yeah, the auto-loading always felt more like a... The, my perspective, this is just my perspective, the auto-loading always felt more like a very convenient interactive experience and not a scripting experience. If I was going to do it, you know, we just, and, and so I would not use it in scripting in general. I'd use it more as an ad hoc, but because you want to be, I, I, I would prefer the stuff I wrote was explicit. So I knew what the hell was going to happen. There you go. Okay. Nice, nice and pithy. <laughs> Okay, um, maybe I have, a, I have a question that was maybe already answered, but I'm not sure about. Um, we write a lot of, uh, let's say, complicated and, and big partial scripts and want to sell it. Yeah? So we want to. I know everybody goes into the direction to get it for free, uh, GitHub and stuff like that. Um, I follow some of these rules as well and, and do it by myself. But for some of the things, I need to earn some money. Sure. Top money. Yeah, so this is, this is the case. I think we all have the same problem. Everybody, so, I think we have consensus. Family. Everybody likes money. Correct. So, guess what? What Linus makes it feeds his family too. Yeah. What well, what makes it a bit hard for me is that I I do have to give all my knowledge and all my magic was happening behind when I create a module. Yeah, yeah. Visible to a customer, absolutely visible. So what what I want want to ask if there is 
except the obfuscating method or so, is there any ideas in, for in, a, in a pipeline or something where you can encrypt a module when you build it, run it or whatever that, that is not readable by default? The answer is no. However, let me give you a more comprehensive example. At the end of the day, like if you take a look at the, the security work that we did, at the end of the day, it, uh, you, you form a script in a, in a format that the engine can read, right? Whether you encrypted it, at some point you got to give it to the engine. When you give it to the engine, we log it, okay? So the best you can do is there's various tools that will produce an XE or will obfuscate your code before calling it. It can't actually protect your IP, but what it can do is this. It can make it clear that someone's breaking your license in order to get your IP, and that will protect you in court or gives you a better standing in court, right? That is unambiguous that the, you know, they, they didn't happen to just come across this PS1, and, and these people all gave their PS1, and so they saw yours, and so they figured it must be the same, and, and so I copied this and I, I took advantage of it. No, yours will be different. The only way they can get at your code is to combine things through the log, which is going to be very difficult, or to have done a, a reverse engineering task, which will be very easy, but they would not be able to get at your script unless they did it. So it shows their state of mind and their intent. That's the best you can do. Yeah. So obfuscating will be the method. The yeah. I just want to add one thing. The, the, let's say you are in the power cell gallery. I mean, one of the things that you can do is that you can actually have require a license. Yes, actually that can be a link that goes to a particular place where they can actually get a license. So we can make that very clear in the in the gallery. When you have in the description, there is a set of what we call you know dependencies, things that you need. That is something that you can definitely drive. We can definitely say, look, you are infringing the licensing. Now you at least you have a level of empowerment. Because I know uh, Tobias's uh, steroids will produce an yeah. XE. I don't know whether he also obfuscates or not. Do you know? Okay, thank you. Anyway, so there there are tools out there that do that. Okay. Uh, well, you don't need to if you've got a binary module. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we had a, a four uh, GR related sessions at this conference, and I hope that uh, this conference will kind of increase adoption of GR. But I think uh, that uh, uh, as we, if we look at the PowerShell gallery, one of the artifacts that can be downloaded and also uploaded there is a role capability mm -hmm. file. So I would like to ask, uh, are there any plans that Microsoft will set example and share some of their role capability files with the community so that community can learn and adopt Azure uh, Power yeah. uh, Gia, that was Gia easier? Yeah. That was yeah. specifically someone's job last year. You can imagine how their review is going to go this year. Uh, they didn't do that. Apparently, it's hard. But certainly, is we're using Gia extensively through Azure Autom or through Azure Stack, and <clears throat> and all that stuff will be available. You know, I don't know that I'll put it on the gallery, but that that code will all be available. One of the scenarios that I've heard from customers is that they would like to see a solution for Hyper-V, the hoster tenant relationship when the Tenant will enable yeah, hosting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah, one of those things. Yeah, yeah I'm not yeah. sure uh, why that that was turned out to be a, a difficult task to succeed at, but someone was specifically tasked to go do that. So, thank you. Yeah, might might give it to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think so. Okay. Uh, so far, I've never met anybody that actually liked PowerShell workflow. Um, <laughs> so um, instead you could use run spaces but then you've got a how do you call it a problem factory um, but is there any idea plans desire to replace it here, Bruce, you want to well, uh, so specifically, if you're talking about concurrency, then there is an RFC on adding a concurrent task model to PowerShell. Uh, it won't be that much different from a, a lot of what other people have already done. Uh, so no Windows Workflow Foundation using? Uh, they're, they're very different things. Do you want Windows Workflow? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Already shared versus what we're going to release in the future. Yeah. Right? So I want to separate those three. I mean, what if today already a Windows is a Windows? 
I think if we follow so six, one of the things that I think John has been mentioning is that we are actually you know, releasing more from But we should, we should. We should talk about the what URC, which is, is the one that is going to a very high impact. Yeah, I think that uh, there's two different issues, if I might. Though one is um, one is the implementation of workflow, leveraging right the WWF stuff and the um, concept of workflow. Mm -hmm. Right in the implementation, and they're not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. The concept is compelling and interesting. Was it the right call at the right time? Un uncertain, but certainly it was a good effort, and and we got a lot of real good stuff out of it. Now um, that said, the thing people have a tendency to use it most for now is this parallelism, because mm -hmm. we had the parallel keyword. Ironically enough, they don't really use it most of the time for the benefits that that workflow actually gives you of of being able to back stuff out and do checkpoints and restarts and all that stuff, right? And so um, and so, for a while now, we've kind of wanted to actually do parallelism natively in PowerShell. Um, and that's where uh, uh, Bruce's RFC sort of comes into play. So there's the implementation. And we have pondered. And the fact is that if the community came back and said, look, we could get 20% more adoption, 50% more adoption if we just had a re-implemented workflow on a better engine, one that made some sense. You know, we, we're going we're gonna to look at that. But right now, that's not the feedback we've gotten. It's been more about the parallel. And let me be crisp yeah, about, say, yeah, that's absolutely fair. Let me be crisp about what a workflow is and what a workflow isn't. I can guarantee you ask that question, 100 out of 100 people will get it wrong, okay? They'll talk about graphical, blah, blah, blah. They're all wrong. From an architectural standpoint, there's only one difference. Now, a particular implementation of a scripting engine, a particular implementation of a workflow engine will have different capabilities, okay? Uh, parallelism, you can do that in a scripting engine, we've done it. Uh, you can do that in a workflow engine, it's done it. The heart of the distinction between scripting and workflow is exactly this. In a workflow, there comes points in the, in the processing that you can reboot the machine and continue and everything, it's the same as having not rebooted the machine. That is the heart of a workflow. And a scripting engine doesn't do that. If it does it, then it's a workflow engine. That's the difference. Yeah. And an interesting thing is that, that to some extent DSC addresses uh, the same problem that workflow addresses but in a different way. Where workflow is monotonic in, in, in time uh, DSC is monotonic in state. So if you reboot the, mach in, in the machine in the middle, it'll check to see which, which task is already done, not repeat them, and then proceed on with the rest of the tasks. So the net effect is pretty much the same. Uh, for a class of problems. For, for a class of problems. Right. Yeah. So for instance, yeah. Uh, no, you still got more? Okay, perfect. Thank you. No, okay, let's get the corner of the room. They haven't had a chance to. Yeah. Just a quick question. You got mentioned a couple of times about uh, if you're going to finish off classes, interfaces. Is that in the immediate future, PowerShell 6? Imminent. I don't know. When we talk about the, the, the uh, roadmap for classes. Yeah, you're yeah, so, so I, I mean, we've had this conversation with a few people here, uh, I think, throughout the conference, and um, I, I know that the original scenario that we, we you know, built classes for was to, uh, you know, make DSC uh, resource authoring much easier, and I think to that end, uh, you know, we accomplished our goal. Uh, well, and, and to allow uh, framework, things like, uh, yeah, Azure Stack. Basically, Azure Stack is like this general contractor that a whole bunch of people have to satisfy things. And what they found was trying to express a contract with another team through a script interface was one, they didn't think that way, two, people couldn't implement it competently. So they said, give me a class. Let me express the contract in terms of a class. And that's what they do. They say, okay, now implement this class and I will call your class. Absolutely, absolutely agreed. And uh, and I, but I do know that despite accomplishing those those goals, that a number of you have expressed, uh, you know, some shortcomings that you believe are in classes. Um, and and as I, I said in my talk, uh, you know, right now the main priority is to get Mac and Linux up to a a standard baseline 
uh, that's acceptable, uh, you know, in, in parity with PowerShell Core that we shipped on Nano. Uh, and and so I think we'll, we'll certainly be reevaluating classes uh, after the 6.0 uh, RTM or GA release, um, and you'll see that from I believe we have a 6.1 milestone uh, that's in the the issues uh, on GitHub for PowerShell, and and that's where we're currently stashing uh, a number of the, the classes related uh, bugs and enhancements. Yeah, but let me quickly add to this just to set expectations, right? So you've probably heard throughout this week and for a while now that we're being very customer focused, right? We're being transparent about what we do. We're doing our work in the open. We're trying to do our work as, as soon as possible in GitHub, et cetera, with the opportunity so to t allow you to provide feedback. Now here's the model. Let's say we have a plan and we do all this work in the open and you provide us feedback. One or two things are gonna happen. We're gonna ignore your feedback or we're gonna pay attention to it. If I ignore all your feedback, I can give you a pretty high confidence plan of what I'll deliver when. Hmm, but probably I wanna to listen to your feedback. Listening to your feedback means I can't give you a high confidence plan of what I'm gonna deliver when, by definition, okay? So that's the thing I wanna get across. We have a new contract with you. The new contract is we're jointly gonna evolve this thing. Part of that new contract is we can tell you sort of directionally where we're going, but your part of you providing us feedback is, hey, that's the right direction, go faster, or actually before you do that, this is more important. So in terms of being able to say 6.1 will include these benefits to uh, um, uh, uh, classes, we're no longer able to do that. The only time we'll be able to do things like that is, as Kenneth mentioned, when we have a strategic um, imperative we must accomplish this in this time frame. You know, Satya Nadella. Satya does do this stuff. Satya comes down and says, you will do this. And that's the only time we'll say, okay, everything else is negotiable, but we got to do this. And it doesn't happen that often. Uh, also, with respect to classes, uh, what can't you do that you want to do? Uh, I know that getters and setters are an example. And we sort of, we had that in mind. But when we were designing classes, we wanted to we were focusing on essentially being Python equivalent. Python is an extremely successful, very simple language. Um, if we add a lot of complexity to classes, then uh, it becomes well, it yeah, becomes C sharp. Uh, it becomes much <laughs> it becomes much less accessible to uh, people who aren't programmers. I like C and, sharp. Sure, you're a programmer. Yeah, but okay. but. You know, it's not clear that we want to go as far as adding all of the features that are in C Sharp into PowerShell because that's just making it into C Sharp. Um, we want to keep the language relatively simple and and accessible and relatively easy to learn. And this goes back to the file stuff on GitHub. Right. Yeah. In particular, yeah. It, what helps is not oh, I would like X, but I'm trying to accomplish Y. And therefore, I think I need X. Because we might say, oh, the way you accomplish Y is some other way. Yeah, so like when people say, well, one of the things that always comes up is interfaces. What do you want to do with interfaces? What, what is the problem that you, what problem can't you solve today that you need interfaces for? Because correct me if I'm wrong, in our classes, we can implement interfaces. Yeah, yeah you just can't define them. No, no, you, you can do it with properties because the prop it will bind. Um, the, the fields, the properties that are on the PowerShell class are properties. They link as properties, and they will, get, they will properly overload. You can't change the behavior. You don't have getters and setters. But they're properties. They're not fields. So from a linkage convention, you can actually overload something that defines a set of properties. That works fine. I'll, I'll, I'll get but, back to that on, on, on GitHub. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you. Here, here. You get give it to him, and I'll give it to him. You go, and then you're next. No, keep. There's somebody here had a question. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, uh, we are using uh, PowerShell to automate uh, more and more things, and uh, when we have a script which is uh, continuously running, which is like a FireWatcher, for example, is there uh, a way to uh, convert the script as a service? Easily. Oh, like can, to, to turn your uh, script turn the into, script, a, into yeah. a REST API? To, no, no, to a Windows service. Oh, it's a Windows service. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 
quick, quick, quick. If you look at my Twitter feed, you'll find. <laughs> <laughs> If you look at my Twitter feed, you'll find a link to uh, an example. Okay, we're back. Uh, an example of how to do that. Or if you just look for uh, PowerShell service, um, there's an example. It uses add type to do some stuff. But it's a relatively simple and, and quite neat way of turning a PowerShell script into a Windows service. Back. I don't remember the URL offhand, sorry. Okay, when you go to PowerShell Gallery, there is a lot of bunch of stuff, and variety is good. But uh, there are some modules, some uh, thingies that uh, will copy itself. Some people develop things that have uh, a central number of things, and there is another one developing a similar module but with a different things. Uh, a great thing happened with Pesta, with an open source community thing that was kind of supervised by Microsoft on one day and shipped uh, default with the system. Do you intend to do more of that stuff? So grab things and ship with the next version. Are you talking about the internet release from the internet platform, for example, open to Windows? Yeah, like you did with the Pesta. So you took yeah. Pesta and it was a community thing and shipped with Windows as a default one. Right. Now, Pesta is a framework. So I want to separate it. I think it will be so. So I think our strategy about the gallery, I mean, this is how we, we are positioning it. We actually want to be the gallery, the repository for all the modules that we want to consume, either in Windows, on Linux, or in, the, or in Azure. So what we want to do is, the release vehicle is the gallery. If you want to go, basically what we want to do is bring those, install them into that particular version of, let's say, Windows or Linux. If you ship them in inbox, you put them into what I call the engineering system, for example, of Windows. I don't think you want to do that. Because what happens is now, next time that you want to update those particular modules, guess what? You get to wait six months. So I think what we need to, what we want to do is basically enable have high quality, curated, supported modules that they are in the gallery, and then being able to bring those into Windows, and be able to continue updating them through the gallery, not necessarily by shipping them into the Windows build. Can't yeah. slightly differently. Yeah. So let's 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 deconstruct uh, Hester. Okay, why don't you stop? Uh, uh, anybody can go, and you can stop recording, and we'll just keep talking unless they kick us out. <laughs> so let's deconstruct Pester. Um, so basically, what the thing we struggle with is what things do we invest in, our developers in, and what things do we don't? And there's so many things to do that one of the, the kind of key things, differentiators, the things we should do versus let someone else do is the things that we and only we can do, okay? Now, prior to open sourcing, there was exactly one team in the world that could improve the language, add, add to the language. That was this team, okay? So we did that. And things that anybody could do, we would try and say, well, let, that, let somebody else do that, right? Now, when it came to Pester, uh, empirical evidence showed that anybody could do that. The community did that. But at the time, two things, two factors were really going on that came together that made the call. Number one was I had decided that testing was critical, right? Uh, that as we became more mission critical, that it wasn't just about writing a script. You were writing a script that was going to run your business. And then some idiot after you was going to change it and maybe screw up your business. <laughs> so you wanted to write your script along with a set of tests so that other people could modify it and not screw things up. Okay, So that was sort of like this key thing. So Pester was out there, and we thought, well, okay, should, should we do our own? Should we do that? They had a good one. And, but then there was a second thing. The second thing was that we had this new leader. His name's Satya Nadella. And Satya had a very different attitude around open source. Now, Satya made, had this very interesting conversation with us. He said, look, we have acquired, as a, as a community, a Microsoft community, we've acquired what he called learned helplessness, right? You think that you can't do things, but you actually can. And you have to actively unlearn the helplessness and be more courageous and take more risks and lead, okay? So like, wow, okay, that sounds great. I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing. But along with that, he said, he said um, open source. You know, hey, we can use open source. 
And so it's like, well, okay, we can use open source. And those Bing guys, they were using open source because they don't, they're not Windows. Anyway, I looked at this and I said, hey, wait a second. This would be a great opportunity for us to take a community project, which is already great, and embrace it and ship open source in Windows. Let me tell you that turned a few heads. Like, wait, we can't ship open source in Windows. Oh, yeah, we can. We can? Yeah. Anyway, so it, it drove two things. One is it solved a particular problem that anybody could have solved, but I felt it was important for us to take a stand and say, this is how you solve it so that everybody solved it the same way. And it provided us an opportunity to you know, kind of grow our open source muscle. And having done that, then a whole bunch of other teams said, hey, let's open source this. And when people said, we can't open source anything in Windows, they would say, but they did. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. And so it's really opened up uh, the floodgates for more teams to be more open. So that's what happened there. But the basic algorithm of, hey, where is there something that we and only we can do? That's where we want to invest. Uh, or are there some things, where, the example of Pester, is there something anybody can do, but it's strategically important that everybody do it the same way, right? GUI libraries, it's not strategically important for everybody to do the same way. So as much as I continually revisit that question of, hey, should we get into the GUI library business? We don't because of that. And there might be another one where it makes really strategic sense to say, hey, there's lots of different ways to do it. Let's converge and get everybody to do it one way. And if you think there are, I'd love to hear those things. And that's sort of my job is to figure out those things. So one of the jokes about architecture, though it's true, is an architect's job is to decide when one is your friend and when many is your friend, right? So back to this parser business, right? Many parsers is not our friend. Therefore, having everybody produce random standalone command line interfaces, that's evil. Um, uh, hypervisors, many are our friend. Well, happy days, whatever. Well, what I meant was not that take oh. over the GUI, sorry. Uh, I maybe whole, maybe I wrong. rephrase it. That what you did with Pesta was good. So you took the open source community and it's still open source available. So anyone can mm -hmm. update and do whatever they do it with the, from the PowerShell gallery. Do you intend to do it more with more projects like Pesta, like the framework thing? and include them into the system as an open source startup so that anyone can start using that and then use the gallery to update for the new modules by the community, made by the community. That was the question I answered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when it makes strategic sense, yes. Yeah. When it doesn't, no. Another perspective on that, at least from my perspective, is uh, Joey and I have had some conversations about this, and he likes to describe it as, um, you know, we should try to work on incubating more pesters. So not necessarily having new projects from the open source community that we take into PowerShell or Windows, but, you know, working with the community to try to develop more high quality standardized modules that people can leverage for common tasks. So. Uh, one of the things we'll try to do this year is to set up um, sort of a common space where the community can come together and talk about ideas for standardizing on certain modules for things like, you know, build scripts, et cetera. Uh, that way we can, you know, the, the PowerShell team can be involved with the conversation. It can help sort of drive the quality and, and drive the collaboration. But then the open source community, the PowerShell community, is really the ones owning the projects. So we're, we're sort of helping bolster what's already there and not necessarily just trying to make everything ourselves again. Actually, you know, another example, counter example, would be the, uh, the parallel runs, parallel tasks work that Bruce is doing. There were a number of them in the community. Um, we are on the page that says, yeah, that's something that really needs to be, you know, coherent and offered from the, the, the team. Uh, we looked at those things and decided, yeah, there's some great ideas from here and some great ideas from there. And, and that one we decided, no, we would implement our own. All right, we're kind of over time, but it is worth noting because it's the whole open source thing. Is it, um, you know, this is. Goodbye, Joey. Goodbye, Joey. Woo! Uh, as you, um, as we start to develop this more open source muscle, I think we might end up with more subtlety between whether we're taking it over and shipping it in Windows or whether we're endorsing or encouraging it or whether we're 
kind of adding a little weight to it. You know, I think there's a whole whole range here. Yeah. And at the far end, it's you know strategic, and the other end, it's like, okay, how do we just help make practical motions in the right space? So my guess, and this is just a guess, we don't have a concrete plan, but my guess is that over time you'll see us uh, evolve our our answer answer that type of question, so it's a little more a little more um, a little more subtle, a little more more complete. Yeah, can you just highlight on that. So what that means is we can screw things up. And we're very conscious of that, right? Had we gone and, and like with the stuff Bruce is doing around tasks, if we, if we go in there, guess what? Those other things have to be multiple times better for them to gain any traction. There's very little chance that they'll be multiple times better. But if we just get it out there and then we don't enhance it, don't improve it, don't make it better, uh, we will have done you a disservice by having taken the wind out of other people's sails I mean, they can go continue, but it really it's becomes much harder for them once we've said, this is the way we think the community should do it. So we're very cognizant of that power. We want to be very, very uh, uh, wise in its use. Have you thought about doing a um, test version of the PowerShell gallery? Um, have you version. thought about doing a test version of the PowerShell gallery where I can publish my scripts? Last year I, I started publishing some small scripts, Oops. meaning I've taken up some keywords and I feel kind of bad about that because it's really not production code. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what to do about that. But I would love a simple place to test it. So you can together. do that now. You can, there's yeah. a, under, uh, in GitHub, there's a PowerShell prompt. Private PS it's gallery. Private PS gallery. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. that is the infrastructure that basically we use for the PowerShell gallery. So you can go deploy, install it, test it, validate it, and you use the same NuGet protocol. So it's okay, basically cool. a. You could uh, do a little advertisement for that yeah. on the gallery. That yeah. Would be nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah it's could, a great idea. Yeah. 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 It's a great idea. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's kind of I think where you were going is to actually Just enable it within the gallery. Shout yeah. out. We'll yeah. Yeah. Use a voice or GitHub. Which, 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 Joe, okay. Where are you? Well, yeah, sorry. No. <laughs> no, but, no, it's a good question. You, you, you know, this is how I'm. Okay, I'm going to internalize this. Okay. I think it right now, but it's been confusing because until recently, you know, Windows, PowerShell, ships, and Windows. And the vehicle how we file issues, you know, for Windows and Windows Server has been through the user voice. That's been the place that we've been tracking. And then we open source PowerShell. You know, it's part of open sourcing PowerShell. I just want to give you a little bit of the history of how we got here. You, they confuse, and I understand. So when we, we open source PowerShell, well, you know, we open source PowerShell. It means that we want to ask the community to be really transparent and really visible about the issues. We want people to work on the issues, the, the, which means that you want to use the GitHub as the place to file the issues. Why? Because that is actually a place where you can actually have conversations, you can fix it, you can yep. track them, you yep. can report them, because it's a bug system. User voice is not a bug system. And what we need is actually a bug system in order to actually manage the issues and for all of you to contribute and actually take ownership of those issues. I don't want you to think of GitHub as, as issues as a bug tracking system. It's an issue managing system. Yeah. So don't don't limit yourself to bugs in that. Yeah. By the way, so next question has to be about Visual Studio Code or Phosphor. Yeah, yeah, because they like us to answer. Yeah, exactly. We paid for it. Bring this guy all the way over, yes. and I want my money's worth. So somebody ask him a question. I'll repeat a question from earlier today. When will we see Visual Studio Code in uh, Windows 12? Ah, uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> Wait, I, I thought you wrote the whole. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad we brought him. <laughs> we cleared that one right up. I think you may be the second person who's asked about this, so I don't know. Nobody's nobody's really been asking. I for thought it. you wrote Visual Studio Code yourself on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I did. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, I'll ask one. When do we get region support in Visual Studio Code? See, I was expecting Jared Atkinson to ask me that question, but uh, yeah, he left. Yeah. Um, so when will we be able to use script-based script analyzer rules in Visual Studio Code? That's a great question. So uh, I know that uh, uh, Mandy and uh, uh, Thomas Rayner have been working on some script-based rules recently. They've gotten really into like you know making some good rules to add to 
script analyzer, uh, one of the things that we really need to do is make it possible to bring in community contributed uh, script-based analyzer rules into the default distribution. Currently, the uh, default distribution only allows uh, C-sharp-based rules, so uh, it, it will require some changes to the code to enable this, so it won't come immediately, but uh, I would say within the next you know, few months, you'll see some progress on that. Um, Kapil, the guy who maintains that project right now, he's very aware of the, of the need for it, so it's just a matter of prioritizing that work. So, you know, if people keep asking us for it, we'll prioritize it, you know, uh, in, in the more short term. But uh, I really want to do it because I want more people to be able to contribute rules to exactly. Script Analyzer so that exactly. we can all use them. Yeah. But it's a function of asking for it, so David's home phone number is. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need my phone number, they just find me on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> Look, I think the we went over half an hour. I think that we probably want to close. Um, There's only two of them. Two. I know. <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I think, think we, we really appreciate that you stay here. That you've been very interactive. I think we really appreciate it. Oh, look, Tobias is back. So, you know, we finally, now we can finish. We've been waiting for you. <laughs> so, now, bro, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, you know, one thing that would be really helpful is uh, speaking of uh, the future conferences, if how you want us to basically help and contribute, if there is any topics in the future that you want the PowerShell team to address, anything is important, look, we are here for you. So, you know, there will be things that we're going to go and talk, you know, somebody like Jeffrey will give his top of mind. But ultimately, what I want to be sure is that the team, you know, comes here with the context, if with the content that you care. So let us know, you know, you can file listos on GitHub, uh, send us emails, Twitter into the PowerShell team. So and then it uh, kind of help us to prepare and be sure that, you know, people like David will join us again this year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to make one quick announcement because there were so many questions. The Slack space will remain open until next year, so you can go to powershell.live all year long and can keep the connections to the others here. And maybe we should add a channel where people can toss in ideas and things uh, for next year. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah. yeah. Right. Have a safe trip home. Bye bye. Yeah. 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 Yeah.